بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين سيدنا وحبيبنا ونبينا محمد وعلى آله وأصحابه وأزواجه ومن تبعهم بإحسان إلى يوم الدين عن أبي هريرة رضي الله عنه قال قال رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم الدنيا سجن المؤمن وجنة الكافر Still the chapter about not having the love for the worldly gain turning away from the worldly materials and working hard for akhirah this chapter is still is continuing and there are some more hadith about the chapter in this hadith rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says ad dunya sijnul mu'mini wa jannatul kafir this world is a prison for a believer and is a paradise for disbeliever. What does this mean? This simply means Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is telling us that for believers this world is full of restrictions. Everywhere we have to see what's halal and what is haram. You go to a store, you see some nice candies, you feel like eating it. You see some nice cookies, you see some nice food. You feel like eating those. You pick it up, read the ingredients and you find out something is haram and you can't eat it. You are hungry. You go to a restaurant and you find out that they are using the wrong oil. Then you just want to buy some potato chips. You want to buy some french fries. You want to buy some fish. But you find out that this is haram. So everywhere there is restriction in this life for a believer. And everyone there is, everywhere there is halal and haram. For disbelievers, for kafirs, there are no restrictions. They eat whatever they want. They enjoy the way they want. Have all kind of fun and there is no halal and haram for them. So this world is like a paradise for them and is just like a prison for a believer. But if you really look into it, that in spite of being like a prison for us, yet there are thousands and millions of things that we share in common and we use them the way they use it. We have cars, we have, we have houses, we use our eyesight, we use our hands, we use our feet. We use our health, we use our wealth. There are millions of things that we share them in common and we also can use it just the way they use it or many times we might even have it more than what they have. So this is this life and if you look at their paradise, look at their paradise which is this life, what is it that they have? The maximum they would have is, they will have a nice garden around their house, put some nice flowers, keep on smelling those flowers. A person who's even more wealthy, he might have nice swings and swimming pools and different things over there for having a, a lot of fun and enjoy. But if you really look at it, 
Is this is a paradise? This is nothing. They have to clean it, keep on cleaning it every day or every few days or every week. If they have a garden, they have to take care of it. They have to keep on watering the plants. And they have to keep on working all the time in order to keep it the way it is. But the real Jannah is in Akhirah where we won't have to do no work at all. There is nothing that we will have to do over there. Over there you just sit and enjoy and you just wish of having something and you have it there. You see a bird flying in front of you and you're sitting on your couch. And you feel that this is a big bird and nice, so nice. You know, it will be a nice barbecue of this bird. If you get it slaughtered and you have a barbecue, it will be a very tasty barbecue. And right there you will have it in front of you. You just think about it and it's right there. You don't even have to click some buttons. So that's the real Jannah. And as far as their prison in the Akhirah, we all know that's the hellfire. Where they will be burning forever. So Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is making it clear to us that don't compare yourself with the disbelievers. Don't look at their comfort in this life. And don't, don't try to compare yourself with their comfort. Because this is a paradise for them. Let them have all the fun they want in this life. They are, nothing having, they are, they are going to have nothing in the Akhirah. But for us, this is not the place where we should. We are looking for pleasure. For us, this life is just a test for us. is a preparation for Akhirah. And when you are in the exam room, and you're writing your exam, you'll be very careful of what to write. And you'll be very careful of what, what you would do over there. So same thing, our whole life in this world is just a test, is just an exam. And everything is getting written. And on the day of judgment, that's the call, that's called the day of judgment. Quran says, Yawmul Hisab. The day when everyone will be judged for his deeds, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, in other words, will be marking our papers on that day. Which is the paper of our deeds. And then we will pay according to what we have written over there. Our papers will be marked accordingly. And if it says that you have more mistakes than the right things you have done, the angels will see the paper and they will tell you, okay, that's your direction over there. Well, I ask Billah towards the hellfire. So this life, in this life, we should never try to compare ourselves with the disbelievers and look at their comfort and then try to get that comfort. That's not for us. And that is not something that we should be looking for it ever. We should never try to look for that worldly gain and for that materialism. In fact, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us in Quran that He would like to give a lot of gold and silver to disbelievers in this life. He likes to give it to, this, to the disbelievers, a lot of gold and silver. But he is not giving it to them because if he would start giving it to them, then believers will turn away from Islam. Muslims will turn away from Islam in order to get that gold and silver. In another hadith, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was asked, a man came to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and he said, Ya Rasulullah, dullani ala amal. إِذَا عَمِلْتُهُ أَحَبَّنِي اللَّهُ وَأَحَبَّنِي النَّاسِ Ya Rasulullah, tell me something if I would do it. People will like me and Allah will like me. Both together. It's not that easy. Normally, if the person is becoming very virtuous, then people don't like him. Allah likes him, but people don't like the virtuous people. And... People will start blaming him with different things. Oh, you're always just in your readings. You're always in your salah. You're always in the masjid. 
And if the person becomes total in the world and spends his time after the worldly things, then people will like him, but Allah doesn't like him. So this person is questioning, Ya Rasulullah, Dullani ala amal. Tell me something, if I would do it, Allah will like me and people will like me. What is it that he can do? Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, and this is one of the miracles of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, when we look at these type of hadith, where some short and very difficult questions were presented to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Where if those, whereas if those questions were presented to us, we would never have an answer for them. And if we try to reply, we might say, I have to give you a whole lecture before I can make you understand this. But Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala blessed him with such an understanding that the most difficult question, he would answer it in few words. He would answer the most difficult question in few words. You don't find any hadith where Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was asked a question and he will take an hour to explain about that thing. And it will be only sometime you look some of the hadith, extremely difficult question, but he will answer it. If you read the answer, it will take you about 30 seconds. 30 seconds for replying to that difficult question. Sometime it might take a minute. Hardly you will find a hadith where it will take more than a minute of explanation of the hadith of reading the answer of the hadith from Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam to a most difficult question. And here we are for minor things we have to give lectures of an hour and still we are not at the end we have to tell I wasn't able to explain it properly. So this is one of the miracles of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And especially with us, we are reading thousands of books. And then we are not able to answer all of these questions. And Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, how many books did he have? He had a library? No. He didn't have no book. He had no book. So where was he getting all the answers from? Through the revelation. He was getting it from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was asked, and this man is asking, Ya Rasulullah, tell me something. If I would do it, people will love me and Allah will love me. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Izhad fi dunya yuhibbuk Allah, wazhad fi ma inda nasi yuhibbuk an nas. This is the whole reply, not even 30 seconds. What is it that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam replied to that man? He said, do not love the worldly material. Allah will love you. Do not keep the love of the worldly material in your heart. Allah will love you. And this is exactly what La ilaha illallah means. La ilaha means there is nothing in my heart. Nothing that I would obey, nothing that I would listen to you, to li uh, nothing that I would listen to, except Allah. That's all that I have in my, heart, in my heart. La ilaha, there is no God, which means none is worthy of worship, which means nothing in my heart that I would obey, except who? Allah. Except Allah. This is what Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said to that person, izhat fi dunya. Do not love the worldly material. Allah will love you. Nowadays, if we look into our heart, we have a lot of love for the worldly materials. We have love for our homes, for our cars, for our wealth, and love for people. There are so much love full into the heart that there is no space to have the love for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala over there. So therefore, we have to get all of these things out of our heart. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Get the love of these worldly material out of your heart. Yuhibbuk Allah, Allah will love you. And 
از حد فیما عند الناس يحبك الناس Do not keep your eyes on what people have Don't keep your eyes on what people have Don't love what people have People will love you What does this mean You know if someone has something nice and you look at it and you feel you know something very nice I wish if I can have it and you talk to that person you know mashallah your this pen is so nice and that person gets a, he he understands it okay you like it and sometime you speak to people in such a way that they figure out that you need something from them so people don't like others looking at what they have they like to keep it for themselves and therefore once people find out that this person is always looking for something from me so they don't like that person anymore if we have relationship and friendship with those people who have a lot of wealth and they are very nice to us also so sometime we tell them you know today i really need 100 dollars okay he will very gladly will give it to us mashallah this is my teacher this is imam this is a scholar okay here take 200 dollars after some time you tell him you know uh, i don't have a fridge my fridge something happened to my fridge i need a fridge for my home okay he says here i'll give you my fridge or i'll buy one for you next time he sees you or you go to him you call him that i would like to come and see you for a minute now he's thinking all the way he's thinking that he might be asking for something i don't know what is he going to ask for today although he gave those things very willingly at the time in the beginning but now he's thinking that he might ask for something else and he doesn't like it he doesn't like you always be after him and i need this and i need that and always keep on begging him for things that you need this is why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala teaches us in Quran that always whenever you need something ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because you can never you will never be ashamed asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and he will be never be ashamed to give you that thing and at the same time Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala he will never have he will he's not there is nothing that he doesn't have and he will have to tell you that i'm sorry i don't have it so you don't put him on the spot he is never upset in fact he's upset with those who do not ask him for it here in this life when we ask people for something then they get upset he's always asking you give couple of times then you get tired of giving but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gets upset when you, when you don't ask him. So he always wants us to ask him for whatever we need. To the extent Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, if a person breaks his shoes, the first thing we should do is, normally what the first thing we should do, we normally we do is, we think about where is the closest store that I can go and buy the shoes. Here is this store, I think I can find one over here. Let me run to the store. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said anything you need the first thing you should do is return to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and say ya Allah here is the problem I need this and now you go ahead and start looking for it so first thing you do is ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in another hadith Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said you are at your home you need some salt what is salt everyone has it sometime you may run out of it and you know all know everyone knows that we can just run out and bite any from anywhere you need some salt rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam said first thing you should do is ask allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for it so the smallest thing in the world first thing we should do is turn to allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and say ya allah this is what i need and then go ahead and try to find it wherever you can so rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam in this hadith is telling us don't have the love of the worldly gain allah will love you 
and don't have the love of what people have. Don't expect to get things from people. People will love you. And if you start expecting things from people, then people don't like you anymore. In another hadith, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, said to Sahaba Ridwanullahi alayhi wa ajma'een, Inna li kulli ummatin fitna. Every ummah has something that they will be tested by. There is something that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala put the ummah through a test by that thing. Wa fitna to ummati al mal. My ummah is tested by the wealth. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made the main fitna. Evil and a test at the same time for this ummah, the wealth. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Quran al kareem that sometime he tests the people by giving them something. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives us some wealth. فَأَمَّا الْإِنسَانُ إِذَا مَبْتَلَاهُ رَبُّهُ when the Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tests the person, فَأَكْرَمَ He gives them a lot of honor. وَنَعْمَ Gives him a lot of blessings. فَيَقُولُ رَبِّي أَكْرَمًا The person says, Oh Allah is so generous, He's being so nice to me. He's judging Allah according to the wealth he gets. In other words, if your father keeps on giving you a dollar every day, then your father is a good father. And if he doesn't give you a dollar every someday, then he's a bad person. Then you don't like your father anymore. So you like your father only for a dollar. Your father worth a dollar to you. If he won't give you the dollar, he doesn't worth nothing. Then I don't like him anymore. He's not a good father. Your mother worth a, worth a candy. She gives you the candy, she is good. She doesn't give you the candy, you don't like your mother anymore. So how much she worth then? A candy. Same thing, people judge Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala according to what He gives them. If He gives us wealth and we keep on getting, then we say, oh Allah is so generous, He's so nice, mashallah. And the person, when as soon as he loses something, he says, you know, I don't know why I always get these problems. I don't know why Allah will, ayazu billah, some people say this, but ayazu billah, that I don't know why Allah will always, these hardships, he sends them on me. So we judge Allah according to what we get. This is what the Jews used to do. In Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says about the Jews, وَقَالَتِ الْيَهُودُ يَدُ اللَّهِ مَغْلُولَةِ Jews used to say that Allah's hands are closed. What does this mean? They used to say that we are working hard to earn. And we work hard enough that we should earn more. It's only Allah is not giving it to us. So Allah's hands are closed. We don't like it. In fact, another beautiful example of Jews in Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, They used to say to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam that if Jibreel alayhi salatu wa salam bring, will bring the revelation, we are not going to accept it. Who brings the revelation to you? Jibreel alayhi salam, we are not going to accept that revelation. This Quran is revealed through Jibreel alayhi salam, we don't want this Quran. So then what do you want? We want Mikail alayhi salam to bring the revelation. Then we will accept it. Why? Can you figure out why? Because Jibreel alayhi salatu was salam is the angel that brings the revelation. And when people don't take the revelation, don't accept the revelation, he's the one who brings the punishment. And Mikail alayhi salam is the angel that brings the risk food. 
So they say, if we get the revelation through Mikail a.s. because he brings the food, therefore we are going to accept it from him, but not from Jibreel a.s. So they judge everything according to what they get. Whoever is giving them some money, some food, okay, here, I'll take it from there. This is why there is a joke. You know, of course, these Jews, they like wealth a lot. They like money. There are a lot of jokes about them. And Quran also speaks about them, that how much they love the money, how much they love the wealth. That a Jew was drowning in the ocean. And a person standing over there, he saw this Jew is drowning and he says, there were two people standing there. One of them was calling on him. He says, give me your hand, give me your hand, give me your hand. Why is he asking for his hand? To save him. So that he, was, he wouldn't give him his hand. So the other man said, here, take my hand. So he, he, right away he held his hand. Which means he didn't want to give, he wanted to take. So he says, take my hand. So he gave him the hand. He, he went and he held his hand and he came out. But the first man is telling him, give me your hand. So he doesn't want to give. He says, I can't give nothing. I don't want to give. I can draw and I can die. But I won't give. Also they make a joke about him, about the Jews. That the angels, the Jew died and the angel asked him, here is Jannah, here is hellfire. Where do you want to go? Where would you choose? So the Jew was asked, here is the Jannah, here is the hellfire, where is it that you want to go? So he said, you know, I really don't know. But tell me, where is the money? I'll go that way. Where is the money? So, this is where really the worldly gain takes the person. Extreme love of it. And finally, they were blaming Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that he doesn't want to give us. We are working hard, but Allah is not giving it to us. So they judge Allah according to what He gives them. And this is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says about this ummah, that many people in this ummah, they judge Allah according to how much He gives them. If He gives them a lot of wealth, they say, MashaAllah, He's very generous, He's good. And if He takes something away from them, وَلَيَعْزُبِاللَّهِ They start blaming Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. فَأَمَّا الْإِنسَانُ إِذَا مَبْتَلَاهُ رَبُّهُ when Allah tests a person, فَأَكْرَمَ He gives him. When Ama gives him a lot of blessings, فَيَقُولُ Rabbi أَكْرَمًا He judges Allah according to that and he says, Allah is very generous and He is giving me a lot. He is so good. وَأَمَّا إِذَا مَبْتَلَاهُ And if Allah puts the person through another test now, and فَقَدَرَ عَلَيْهِ رِزْقَهُ He makes his sustenance difficult on him. So this person says, فَيَقُولُ رَبِّي أَحَانًا Oh, Allah is putting me down. I don't know why He's not giving it to me. He's giving it to those disbelievers. The kafirs have a lot of wealth. I don't know why we don't have it. So people judge Allah, وَالْعِيَازُ بِاللَّهِ وَالْعِيَازُ بِاللَّهِ According to the wealth, according to how much He gives them. And Umar radiallahu anhu making this point very clear to us, he says in the hadith, That when Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was alive and until the day he died, لَقَدْ رَأَيْتُ رَسُولَ اللَّهِ صَلَّى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمْ يَظَلُّ الْيَوْمَ يَلْتَوِي مَا يَجِدُ مِنَ الدَّقْلِ مَا يَمْلَأُ بِهِ بَطْنَهِ Umar radiallahu anhu says, look at this hadith. Explaining the situation of the Prophet of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He says, I have seen sometimes Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam starving for the whole day, holding his stomach, he's hungry. He cannot get even rotten dates, bad dates. He cannot get even bad dates that he can eat something and something that can satisfy his hunger. Not even bad dates, rotten dates. He cannot get, get them to satisfy his hunger. This was his situation. And look at what Aisha radiallahu anha says. Aisha radiallahu anha says, When Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam died, ما ترك عند موته دينارا ولا درهما He did not leave back any dollar or even a penny. Dinar, dirham, their currency. Not a dollar, not even a penny. 
وَلَا عَبْدًا وَلَا أَمَا No servant, no one to serve him, to work for him. وَلَا شَيْئًا And nothing else in his homes. The houses were empty. Except إِلَّا بَغَلَتَهُ الْبَيْضَاءَ الَّتِي كَانَ يَرْكَبُهَا Except Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam had a mule for riding and he had some weapons that he used to use in the battlefield that's all he left behind him. So this is the Prophet of Allah. And who was more liked and loved by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala than his Prophet? Allah loved his Prophet. But he never gave him, gave him all the wealth. That tells us that having the wealth is not the sign that Allah loves the person and losing it is not the sign that Allah is punishing the person. In fact, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam advises us in one of his ahadiths, a beautiful hadith, something very important. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, لا تتخذ الضيعة This hadith is in Tirmizi. لا تتخذ الضيعة Do not acquire properties. Do not acquire properties. Why? He says, فَتَرْغَبُوا فِي الدُّنْيَا Otherwise you will have a lot of love for your properties and then you would want to stay here for longer. If you acquire properties, you will love your properties and you would, would, li you would like to stay there for longer. If you don't have too much property, then you don't want to stay here for too long. There is nothing holding you back here. And if you really make the property in the Akhirah, you make everything that you need, you keep it for the Akhirah, as one of the Tabi'een says. He says, whenever I like something and I love something, I give it as a charity. Whenever I like something, I give it as a charity. Why? He says, because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala promises that whatever you give away, you will get it back in the Akhirah and get it in a much better form in Jannah. So he said, when I like something, I give it away, so I get it over there. I don't need it over here. If I keep it over here, I will lose it sooner or later. So I better give it away, so I know that because this is a promise of Allah, and Allah will never break His promise, so I give it away, so I get it in the Akhirah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will give it to me there. And this is really people who had the real understanding of deen. People who really had the understanding of the sayings of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. This is why one of the Sahaba, when he heard the ayah of Quran that says, لَن تَنَالُوا الْبِرْ حَتَّى تُنْفِقُوا مِمَّا تُحِبُّونَ You cannot achieve the great reward till you spend what you love. He went, he had a business. He had a nice huge garden. He went and he gave it to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He said, Ya Rasulullah, this is a donation on my behalf. Why? Because Allah says you get a great reward only by spending what you love. And this is what he loves. Could we think, anyone of us can even think, giving out our business, giving out our homes as a charity? So here we have to think that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says, don't keep a lot of things in the worldly life. Don't have property. Because then you will love to stay here and you will dislike going back to Akhirah. Build your homes over there and everything that you like, send it over there. So then you will always hope, you know, now Alhamdulillah, I have sent a lot of things for that Akhirah. I have given so many charities. I have given so many things that I used to love for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now I wish I can go there quick and go and get it from there. Now you will be waiting for the day that you go back because you have a great promises from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that this is what you will have over there because you gave it for His sake. Abdullah bin Amr radiallahu anhu said, once Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was passing by our home and we were fixing our house. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Ma hadha? What are you people doing? He said, we were fixing the roof. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam asked, What are you people doing? So we said, Ya Rasulullah, It was leaking 
and it had some problems, so we are fixing it, Ya Rasulullah. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Ma ara al amra illa a'jala min dhalik. I think it's still your house has a longer life than you. Even though it's broken, still your house has a longer life than you. You better fix your life before you fix your home. Look at the important message. A beautiful way of putting the message. That how long do you think you will live? Your house still has a longer life than you. So you need to fix yourself before you, need to, before you fix your home. Because your time is coming soon. So you need your, all the problems that you have in your life, all the sins that you might be doing. And if there is nothing, then the good deeds that you acquire, you better do it in your life. And instead fixing your life, your iman. Do some extra ibadahs, do some extra nafal. We keep on decorating our homes, pending it, new carpets. And now after some time, we are changing everything and more decorations and going out in the markets, spending hours in the markets, trying to look for some better bed sheets than what we already have, some better frames than already what we have. And everything better than what we have, spending hours and sometime days after these things, whereas Really, we need to spend that time on fixing our life and decorating our iman by doing some extra tasbihat, some salah, some recitation of Quran, by helping a needy person, by helping the, uh, the sick people. And a lot of people need a lot of help in this life. Helping those people, this is all a work for our akhirah. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, for example, says in the hadith, whoever will help another person, a needy person in this life, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will fulfill his needs in the akhirah. So, Abdullah bin Amr radiallahu anhu says, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said to me, that al-amru ajalu min dhalik. You might die before this, and your life is shorter than the life of your home, you better work on yourself. In other hadith, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, ma dhi'bani ja'i'an. أُرْسِلَا فِي غَنَمٍ بِأَفْسَدِ لَهَا مِنْ حُسِ الْمَرْءِ عَلَى الْمَالِ وَالشَّرَفِ لِدِينِهِ A very important hadith. He says, If you have two hungry wolves, and you have a flock of sheep, you take these two hungry wolves, and leave them there with those sheep, what the wolves are going to do? They will start eating up those sheep, killing them. They might kill one, eat a little bit of it, go back and eat another one, kill another one, and eat some more of it, run after a third one, and eat some more of it. And this is how, this is what they would keep on doing. They will keep on killing all of those sheep. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says, think how much destruction these two wolves will do. And now he tells us, a person who has two wolves in him, a person who has two wolves inside him, one wolf is the love of the worldly gain of materials, of dollars, of pennies, of other worldly gain. And the second wolf is the greed for the status. Greed for the status. I like people to have given to respect me. I like people to call me the president. I like people to call me Imam, to share. And the greed for the status. So he says two greeds. Greed for wealth and greed, greed for status. These two things destroy our Iman more than what those two hungry wolves can destroy those sheep. These two things inside us. Destroy our iman more than the hungry wolf can destroy the sheep. And if we look at it really, this greed for the wealth, I need extra five dollars, I need extra ten dollars, another this greed for wealth is really destroying our iman and our deen, is hurting our iman and our deen. Most of the times. The work of this deen is being hurt because of the greed of these two things. 
the greed of our wealth, people like more money. And for more money, they will not serve deen, they will stop serving deen, they will do anything, they will even hurt deen. And greed for a status. The Masajid, all the fights in the Masajid, is for that status. Someone wants to be the president. Another person says, no, I'm going to be the president. And people are fighting for status in the Masajid. And this is how they destroy the whole work now. You see, half of the community doesn't want to go to the masjid. Why? Because they say there is a lot of politics. What is this politics is about? Is the greed for status. They're not looking for money, but they're looking for status. So some people fight for greed, have a greed for uh, status. Some people fight for wealth. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, these are the two things that are just like wolves for our iman and for our deen. And they destroy our iman totally. The person feels that I'm serving deen. You look at the person, you feel that he's really serving iman and serving deen. But because of the greed that he has in his heart, the whole iman is destroyed. In the akhirah, when that person will be standing over there, he will realize and everyone will, uh, will find out that all the work that that person was doing as imam, as teacher, as a scholar, as whatever, he got nothing out of it except some dollars. And here in this life, he has nothing from it. He has no reward at all. So Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is advising us of this. And a very important hadith that we have to keep in mind, especially for us, those who are in serving deen. We should never be looking for wealth. We should never be looking for money. We should never be looking for status. Keep on serving deen without having any greed for anything. Just serve deen solely for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. With the pure intention that all you need by serving this deen and this Islam is the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In our teachers, we had teachers, and especially our teachers' teachers. We had many of those examples that they were getting paid such an amount. And when they were offered from the school to raise their, pay their payments, they refused to take more. They said, no, whatever we are, we are getting is enough for us. So what are we going to do with more? In fact, one of our scholars, once he went to his office, to the office of the school where he used to teach, and he said that I would like you to reduce one third of my salary. What? People fight for raise and here he's asking them to reduce it. He says, I would like you to reduce one third of my salary. So they asked him why? Why would you like to re reduce it? He said because we were three members in our family, me, my wife and my mother. And my mother passed away now. So now I don't need those that much. So now we are only two people in the family, so two thirds of the salary should be enough for me. So therefore I don't need that extra one that I, I, use, I, I used to get and I used to spend it on my mother then I don't need it anymore. This is how those people were serving Deen. No greed at all for the worldly gain. And we have some very amazing examples over there. Our own teacher, Shaykh al Hadith, Mawlana Zakariya, Rahmatullahi Alayhi, you must have heard about him. He was getting a very minimum amount of salary. Of course, he used to teach in India, so he was getting about, I don't even remember, it was somewhere around 15, 20 rupees. You know, what's that? It's nothing. Might be about 20 cents according to our currency now. He was getting that in a month. So he got an offer from, from somewhere else, 
that will pay you 800. Now we are talking something. Will pay you 800. And will give you a car with a driver, a nice home, free house for living. And all you have to do is teach for three hours a day, not like what you have to do over there, eight hours a day. So instead of eight hours a day, three hours a day. 800 instead of 15 or 20. And a free car with a driver. And all the expenses of the, on the, of the car will be on them. So he said to them, I'm not living for this in my life. My life is not for this. My life is not for this. A very important statement. My life is not for these dollars. That if you give me 800, I'll come to you. Someone else will give me 1,000, I'll go to them. Someone else will give me 2,000, I'll go to them. It's just like you have a dog and you show the, you show the dog a bone so the dog will run to you. He comes to closer to you, he finds out it was a stone. So now another person shows that dog another bone and that dog runs to him. So if you have nothing in your hand, the dog won't come to you. He will never come to you if you don't have nothing in your hand. He will run away from you. So he says, I'm not living, my life is not for this. And really this is something very important. We have to decide for ourselves that our life is not cheap. And it's not for these things. Our life is for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. For the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And our life is for what Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam had spent his life for. That's the most valuable thing in the life. Is what Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam spent his life for. So Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is telling us, that this, these are the two wolves inside us, wealth and status, that normally destroys our deen, that totally destroys our deen. The second, in other hadith, Abdullah bin Mas'ud radiallahu anhu says, once Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was laying down, when he got up, we saw a lot of marks of the mat on Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam's body, because that mat was built, was made out of the leaves of a palm tree. So he was laying on that and you know, he got some marks. So the Sahaba Ridwanullahi said, Ya Rasulullah, please allow us to get you some nice mat, some nice carpet. You have this old mat made out of leaves. Ya Rasulullah, allow us to give you some nice carpet, that's all. Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, no. And what's the reason? مَا أَنَا فِي الدُّنْيَا إِلَّا كَرَاكِبٍ اسْتَظَلَّ تَحْتَ شَجَرَةٍ ثُمَّ رَاحَ وَتَرَكَهَا He says, my example with this life in this life is, just like a person who's having a little rest under a tree, he was traveling, he went under a tree, he had a little rest, and then he left, he got up and left. He said, this is my life in this world. Then I'm having some short life over here, then I will leave this world and go away. So if a person, just think now, if you are on a transit, you are going from here, for example, you want to go to, for Umrah. So your destination is Jeddah. But you travel from Buffalo and you have a short stop in New York. So at New York airport, you start going to the stores, buying a lot of frames, everything, and putting it on the, on the, uh, on the airports. You are trying to decorate, starting decorating the airport. <laughs> You go out, buy a bucket of a pal of paint and some brush and rollers and start painting the airport. And now you go out and buy some carpet and start carpeting the airport. And someone asks you, what are you doing? He says, you know, I'm decorating this. So it, it will look nice. It will look beautiful. For what? How long are you going to stay here? Oh, my flight is, oh, after two hours I have my flight. My I have to catch my next flight. So that person will tell you what's wrong with you. Just for these two hours that you will be spending here, you are working so hard, what are you going to get out and get out of it? So same thing Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa said, if I get a nice carpet and everything nice decoration in my home, what is it that I'm going to get out of it? Uh, soon I will be leaving the world and I will go back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is exactly our life.
This is exactly our life. So we have to understand the reality of this life. And understanding the way Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa explained it to us, sometimes we get so proud of the wealth that we have. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa said in the hadith, يَدْخُلُ الْفُقَرَاءُ الْجَنَّةَ قَبْلَ الْأَغْنِيَاءِ بِخَمْسِ The poor people will enter the Jannah 500 years before the wealthy people. 500 years. Not five years. Even five years are too much to be delayed from going into the Jannah. 500 years will be the difference between the poor and wealthy people in entering the Jannah. Poor people will be in Jannah 500 years before the wealthy people. Because those people will be judged for all of their, whatever they have earned and they spent. Each and every penny that we earn and spend, we have to be judged for it. So it takes a longer time. Poor people will just walk into the Jannah. So this is the reality of our life. And this is what we have to understand and keep in mind all the time. Whatever we earn, we should have some portion of that spent in the path of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Never try to just keep on collecting and gathering. Up to this day, I know one of my teachers. Up to this day, one of my teachers. His salary, his wages is minimum. And minimum means before the end of the month, everything ends. And I know about him this much. He never counts his money. He never counts his money. He never tried to figure out, okay, if, let me count. If I have $50, then I'll buy this. And if I have $60, i will buy that. He never counts his money. He keeps his money whenever he gets the wages. He keeps the, takes it cash. He puts it on one side and keeps on spending whatever he gets, whatever he needs. He just pays for it from there. And finally, when he sees over there, there is nothing. Now, okay, now I know I can't buy nothing. That's all. Up to this day, there are people like this. And why he doesn't count? He says, because there is an ayah in Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَيْلُلِّ كُلِّهُ مَزَتِلُّ مَزَةً أَلَّذِي جَمَعَ مَالًا وَعَدَّدًا Allah curses the person who keeps on gathering wealth, money, and keeps on counting it. Jama'a means to gather, and عَدَّ يَعُدُّ means to count. So he keeps on gathering it and counting it, 